So we are unbelievably lucky. Uh, the animation centrifuge has managed to bring Carl Ganass over from Hollywood, where he's one of the major dynamic drawing and anatomy instructors for Disney, for DreamWorks, for Sony Imageworks. He's worked on the Harry Potter franchise, worked on Stuart Little. Uh, all of the areas of character design, musculature, for moving image and hosting as our Scottish uh, resident genius of visual pictorial storytelling. We have Frank Quitely or Vince Dean as his family known. <laughs> and the first thing I was thinking of asking you guys to compare notes on was the relationship, if you like, between what people often think of as being the comic book approach to breaking down a narrative for a storyboard for a movie and how you do that for a printed image as opposed because when recently you were doing that for Nothing to Declare as a short film, do you guys have a particular take, either of you, on how you visualise the sequence of events in a narrative? Well, um, uh, they're both visual ways of telling stories, comic book style and uh, animation, for instance. And uh, when you're storyboarding for, say, uh, um, feature animation or even television animation, you're thinking about sequence. Sequence is extremely important. Um, and it has to make sense. And some of, some of the sequences that, that, that you showed me were actually storyboard-like in, in your comic book style. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, comic book style doesn't have to um, conform to those same restrictions. Because when the eye looks at the page in the comic book, it takes in the whole page. It's a piece of art in itself. Or a two-page spread can be a piece of art in itself. When people look at a comic book page, generally speaking, they're looking at, at a variety of ways. You look at the whole thing, you enjoy the whole thing, the construction of it. You can go into the sequence, you can get up and walk away. You, it's got, you can review. Whereas uh, conventionally in, uh, um, in animation, the sequence Unfolds continues. in real time. There's, it's in real time. Yeah. So you don't have that same review ability. Mm. Which means that uh, uh, when a viewer is looking at a comic book, for instance, if something doesn't make sense, they've got time to pick it up and piece it together. Mm. Uh, Vin was telling me that it's really important, though, that when you're, you're looking at sequences, that they make sense. And, uh, and I certainly appreciate that, having been a storyboard artist for Disney for a number of years. Uh, sequences are really important. Nonetheless, there is a luxury in the comic book style mm. in that you, uh, you get a chance to look at things and piece things together in your own way, which I think is terrific about comic books. And when you were listening yesterday, when Carl was doing the presentation for all the uh, animators and riggers and the people that were there from Access and various different mm -hmm. colleges, what did you make as a comparison in your head between how you approach uh, superhero musculature or how you, because obviously you're composing in a very different way. Uh, was there any of that that, what was going through your head when you were listening to it? <laughs> well, one of the things that was going through my head was, was uh, the, the speed and accuracy of, of Carol's work, but also the the sense of the sense of movement, uh, the, the sense of dynamism, the sense of weight. Um, yeah, you know, of course. and yeah. it's interesting because th there's so there's so much crossover, but at the same time, the end product, the animation and the comic, are, are so different, and mm. um, and in both sequence is is often is key. But as as Carol's already said in the, in the animation, the, the sequence is unfolding in real time, and everything has to everything has to to work in linear time. Whereas on the comic page, you read through you read through the, the comic, but you do also see the page as a whole, and you actually have to consider the composition of the whole page. You know, not just like a, a flip book. Yes, of course. You know, so yeah. it's, it's the same. first thing you see. You open yeah. it up. There. Mm -hmm. And you touched on that when we uh, we went over to Edinburgh to go to the Beyond Caravaggio exhibition. Right. And when Kier, one of the students yesterday, was asking about negative space. That's right. And you were because again, it's very much the two-dimensional 
medium versus something that is very, very to do with depth and mm -hmm. uh, the surroundings of, right. the, of the figures. The eye doesn't just go across, up and down, it also goes in and out. So composition works both ways. You can, you can scan this way, but um, compositionally you can take a person, you can take a person's eye on mm. a journey in and out and around. Which you can do yeah. by pulling focus in a movie setting. Exactly, you but can do your, the same thing. Uh, your way of doing the conjurers, I'm sending your eye here on the page or here first and there second, yeah. is, is quite a tr traditionally two-dimensional device to get that mm -hmm. to happen. Yeah. Well, I think... Or is it? <laughs> well, y yes and no, it, um, because you can... One of the ways you can pull so the eye as towards as I'm a saying focus... That, I'm looking at that and saying, how can I talk to you about two dimensions? With, <laughs> it, do you know, because that is so volumetric. I mean, the, the sense of what's happening in time in space through that kind of canyon street setting and the, the foreshortening of the vehicle and everything. Uh, as I'm saying that, I'm thinking that's just well, so not true. Very, very often, one of the ways of, of pulling the eye to a, to a focus somewhere in a composition is, is using perspective. And if you have a vanishing point behind the thing you want people to look at, all the other, all the other lines, if, if it's a street scene, or, all the other lines can pull the eye yeah. towards this. Mm -hmm. But also, where the characters in a composition are all turning or looking or, you know, what they're focusing on can also pull the focus, but... Um, they can lead the eye. Yeah. yeah. I actually, um, years ago, um, Will Eisner, who, who's a, a giant of comic books, yes. um, he came to Glasgow and we had a comic club and he... Uh, and there were so many people wanted to show their work that everybody was only allowed to bring two pages, so I brought... The, what I, the two pages I was most proud of this was back in the early 90s I think and, uh, and I waited in line to see Will Eisner to, to get some advice and he looked at my pages and he said these are very good, these are very good and then he just pointed at a panel uh, and said unless there's a good reason otherwise try and keep the focus of attention in the centre of the panel and he gave me the pages back I thought oh I wanted more than that <laughs> and funnily enough it's just so often over the years unless there is a good reason I tend to have the focus somewhere near the centre of the, of the image but, and um, you, you're about to because you have five different countries that you're visiting on your lecture tour at the moment is that right? Six Six mm -hmm. and the exhibition is in Rome. Am yes, I right? the, the exhibition is in Florence. In Florence, right? Yes. And can you say a little bit about what I mean? If somebody were to visit the exhibition here at the Calvin Grove and make a comparison of what you're showing in the artwork that's going to be in Florence, what what are your what was your what were your thoughts in the way that you pieced together? Was that curated as an exhibition, or is that what you uh, chose? Well, I uh, I. I think it was rather different. It's, uh, it, this, this feels very grandiose to me, wonderful. And it looks like you've had some time to put it together. I don't feel like I've had a great like deal. <laughs> I don't feel like I've had a great deal of time. I've never been there. Um, uh, you know, I've seen pictures. So my first experience of it will be when I arrive and the show is opening. So I have, uh, it's, I'm, I have a curiosity about how it's going to happen. They asked me for 100 drawings. And, and some prints, and, and I provided those. But it's, it's going to be a surprise to me. And, uh, 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 and they're take, basically taking care of the whole show. This will give me my first kind of first uh, foray into uh, doing gallery work abroad. And, 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 you know, I have certain expectations, but I have really no idea <laughs> of, <laughs> how it's going to be. It's held in a really beautiful space. And uh, it, I think it's an outside garden. It's got a lot of uh, sculpture in it, magnificent pieces of, well, they're copied sculptures from the original pieces mm. around Rome. So it has a real presence, the room. You know, I've got my little drawings in there. In the back. <laughs> but where we're sitting, if people haven't already visited the Kelvin Grove exhibition, the space that we're in, while the exhibition is open to the public, is packed, not only with school kids, but with teenagers, adults, drawing because people come into the space and yeah. they're, they're seeing so much of the early rough artwork they're moved inspired actually to go and begin image making themselves mm -hmm. a lot of what our motivation has been for getting you over here but also for getting you talking with Vin and other people creative people here in Scotland mm -hmm. is related to this thing that you, you name check a guy like Will Eisner yesterday in your demonstration 
you were actually recreating a, a foreshortened arm from a Pontormo. From a Tiepolo. Tiepolo, sorry, yeah, uh, yeah. a Tiepolo uh, um, painting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where in all of this big picture are we as far as teaching people to draw, encouraging people to be visual artists? What, what, where are we at? What can we, what do we need to be doing the better to equip the generation that's coming up for work in the movie industry, animation industry, comic books, visual effects? What should be our approach be to drawing and painting and sculpting and visual, the tradi traditional artistic craft skills? Big question. <laughs> well, that's a big question. I, I think two of the things you've already touched on. One is having the conversation and making the conversation public um, because it's a conversation that's happening in art schools, in animation studios, in the visual creative industries all over. And the other thing is um, inspiring people. And from the feedback I've had from the museum staff, much of what seems to actually fire people's imagination or, or just generally impress them is when they see finished images, um, maybe like when they, they, they see finished animations, these, these look great, but there's, there's a, it's almost like the hand of the artist is lost through the computer the wizardry or whatever. The artist, yeah. And yeah. when people see a simple pencil drawing on paper, they understand what it is, and they and they can see the illusion, and they, they can allow themselves yes, to be fooled by the, the illusion. Way. But they can keep then looking at the yes, the page yes. again, see, well, it's just a it's just a pencil drawing and paper. And when I was looking at your drawings yesterday in the in the talk, so often, even in the the thirty second poses and the one minute poses, I was seeing, I was seeing a fully rounded the illusion of. A fleshy, weighty body yeah. with with the bones and the muscles around them in the right position. Yeah. And but I'd look again, knowing that it it took you thirty seconds, and seeing how simple in inverted commas the the, the mark making was to create that illusion. And that I think I think the, the people are inspired by that. You know the the the, the directness of it. Yeah, I, I think so, and um, uh, and I, I think people, like you said, you're you're trying to encourage and and uh, encourage people's enthusiasm for something they already have a tremendous interest in. Uh, in my public classes, uh, as opposed to the ones I do in the studios, I get a lot of people that are new, and oftentimes I have uh, I have people come from the studios to my public classes as well. So I get animators that come. So what I have is a real mix. Mm -hmm. And it creates a charge in the room. And, uh, and, and therefore, I can, when I start to talk about these things that interest me, what happens is, is that I can have a conversation with those that know. And uh, we have this conversation, and therefore, everybody gets to participate in that conversation, regardless of what level they're at. Mm -hmm. So they, can, they, they get a sense of the full range of what it's going to take, um, uh, what the expectations are, where their personal interest is in the in the development, where they might want to go with it, and then we talk about um, the actual skills and the development of skills, and they become very willing. <clears throat> One of the greatest things, though, that I I feel like I have to overcome, and they have to overcome, is uh, old habits. Um, generally speaking, when people are learning to draw, they develop habits. We all develop habits, right? Mm -hmm. And in order for growth to occur, those habits have to be um, released. And when they're released, then it's possible for new things to occur. Um, I know I have that all the time in my life. And I know that they're all experiencing that. If I want them to try something new and they go uh, yes to it and then go right back and do the same old thing, that becomes the, the, the real problem, the real thing that one deals with. Once they see that that pattern can be broken, and that they can shift into something new, that brings a kind of an encouragement that nothing else does. Mm -hmm. They actually see a change happen as a result of actually giving something up to receive something new. Mm -hmm. What I also try to do is to encourage people not to do good paintings, but to instead investigate, uh, explore, 
um, to analyze, to conceptualize, and not worry about the result. Mm -hmm. That if they continue to work that way, the artifact will be better and better work. Mm -hmm. Instead of worrying about whether they're doing good work, if they, they work with this process, then the, the results of those processes will produce better pictures, mm -hmm. better, better images. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. I, I, after years of working in comic books, um, I went back to life drawing classes, and I, rather, yeah. than, rather than choose an untutored class, where I could just make nice drawings. And of the repeat human the same old things you always do? Yeah, yeah. I, I went to a tutored class, yes. and uh, it was a guy called uh, Sandy Grant, and he would set exercises where it was, you, you could only look at the model, you couldn't look at what you were drawing, sure. or you had to use continuous line and not lift the pencil, right. or you had to use a certain type of mark making, sure. and, uh, or you had to do negative space or whatever, and it was to break down Break down. The, yeah. All the bad habits that yeah. I'd accumulated yeah. over the yeah. years. Yeah. When, when, when we brought Roy Nesbitt up to launch the base camp last year, mm -hmm. he mentioned that um, Dick Williams brought John Watkiss in to do uh, instruction for all the artists in the studio. And at the sessions, John would walk past Roy and would walk past Dick. And Dick was like, I, I paid you to come and take it. I want you to He said, I can't come in. You're the great Dick Williams. And he said, yeah, but there's stuff that I do wrong and stuff that I don't know. And what, what, are, you looking at, what are you looking at and seeing wrong? Yeah. And John kind of took a deep breath and went, you've never learned anatomy, have you? And went, no, do I need to? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, well, because, because all the things you were talking about yesterday, sure. the clavicle and the, the actually knowing what you're looking at, then when you watch Moana and you see... You um, see all that stuff working yeah, and breathing. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't need to interrupt you. You got no, to a point. No, I was just going to say something else. I, it was something you mentioned yesterday that quite surprised me, and it was with the with the kind of advent of CGI animation yeah. and how rather than that being the final nail in the coffin for traditional drawing skills, it actually worked the opposite way. It worked the opposite way, right? Yeah. And I'll tell you, I get a lot of animators that come into my studio classes, and you, it's amazing when they get back to paper, what that feels like. You, it's just, you know, it's like, like coming to an oasis. Mm -hmm. They come back, they've got something on paper, they feel that paper, they can re-explore. They're not, um, when you're on production, you're basically being asked to perform at a level that they, uh, that they expect from you. And you perform at that level. But when you go into this situation, you can let all that go and re-explore and be allowed to make mistakes and you can take chances and risks and the feel of the paper as you know mm. is quite extraordinary and they come back to that and it's just like oh, it's heaven right yeah. we were really aware when we were at uh, ctn last year where kent melton had his stand and he was working sure. on a sculpt for one mm -hmm. of the character maquettes that that thing of material that you're interacting with something there's a physical response that your fingertips are telling you because pretty much everything Brian Eno spoke about it in the context of electronic music that everything is basically the tap of a mouse or information on a keyboard and he said the difference between that and actually having the resonance of a, an acoustic instrument That's right. it's a totally different kind of feedback that you get from the material but exactly. before I forget the, one, the other thing that occurred to me just as the two of you were talking is that the one thing that animation is not is a solitary pursuit because it's this kind of you know beehive of uh, technicians, artists, organizers. The way that you work with Peter on coloring or lettering, the way you, whatever the team that's involved in developing and producing what you do, it's a smaller team. But yeah. do you have either of you a, a, a picture of how much you depend on the input or the feedback or the role of the other people that you work with to inform or inspire what you're doing, the bit that you're responsible for. In comics, as you say, it's a much smaller team. So it's you. <laughs> well, Plus. it's the writer, it's me, right. it's Rob and Peter. Um, so it's a small team and we all know what each other do and we all kind of trust each other. Yeah. Um, but I had a very different experience when, with Nothing to Declare and I was working with yourself and uh, Once for Farmers and Interference Pattern and uh, making a, a, a short CGI uh, movie. And in that situation, I, I was actually quite worried going into that, that I would have, I would have no control. No, I was would, worried as I was. Yeah. But um, it, it turned out, again, working with other people who are passionate and, and skilled, it's, it, it, 
it was a it was a very different experience for me than than working in comics, but it was it was uh, it was very rewarding. But would you see yourself expanding into the kind of feature work that Carl is a part of as a as a designer and instructor, a, a, a conceptualizer, or whatever? Is that something that would appeal? Working with working with other artists uh, in whatever capacity always appeals. Um, what I would what I would bring to an, uh, an animation uh, team, I don't know because of the the, the differences we've already. Um, we've How described. did you feel when you watched your characters walking around? It was pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty amazing. Did it look how you'd imagined it was going to look as you were? conceiving of the design and the proportions of the character on the page, when it actually begins to emote and articulate, was that...? Yes and no, because what happened was my expectations were very, very vague because it was my first foray into this area mm -hmm. and they were informed <clears throat> as we went along, as I saw your drawings, as I saw the, the, the Martin's uh, modelling, you know, as I saw was Will's direction. Yeah. yeah what, it all slowly... Kind of came together, so I, I was my expectations were growing as I. As we could, the, as we got to show you the the, the, the finished things. I was trying to describe oh yeah, it do without it. doing the spoiler alert thing, mm -hmm. but but yeah. yeah. But well, I mean, I told it. Well, uh, my experience to come in Florence is somewhat like that. I yeah. I'm working with other people. I'm depending on where they decide to take my sure. drawings. So that was my contribution. Um, yes, they're my drawings, but it's their sh in some sense it's their show. And um, and I'm I'm actually part of this show. That was my contribution to it. Like mm -hmm. you provide the story and the inspiration for it, but um, now they're carrying it on, and they're going to add something to that. Mm -hmm. And so, even though you're not working collectively, you are working in a sense with the team. And when I think about my my personal work, um, I'm I'm really trying to keep it very clean from the influences of everybody else's ideas. Mm -hmm. So. In one respect, I'm, I'm really trying to find my own identity and the thing that really interests me. And then on the other hand, um, I'm working with a team of people to try to produce something. Sure. So uh, I'm, I feel lucky that I've, I'm able to pursue in both directions, go deep, more deeply into myself and more deeply into teamwork and working with this uh, sense of uh, strength of a larger production. One of the other things you guys share in a way is that you were kind of born off the map in terms of where these industries had their gravitational center. Yeah. So you grew up sort of a few miles out of central Detroit. Yeah. You weren't kind of at the center of, I mean, I guess people imagine comic book heaven. It, well, I guess Dundee for Scotland is very much the center of the DC Thompson heritage mm. of, of comic book. But what would your advice be or your encouragement to uh, kids at the moment who are looking to move into any of these areas of uh, visual design or, or uh, artistic work in any of these industries who maybe start off thinking oh, I can't get there from here like I'm in the because when I was a kid I mean I, I would watch uh, Hanna-Barbera cartoons, The Flintstones, Tom and Jerry, Disney, and it simply never occurred to me. It was a different, I, I a different didn't make world. a leap of magic. But what now, that all of that is a lot closer and more possible and we have the internet for access, what would you both say to, because I mean you're, you're, your son is also a, 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 an artist, and uh, what, what would your recommend, uh, recommendation be to, if you could go back and kind of talk to your younger self about, you know, you, this, is, this is your world as much as anybody else's, what would you encourage people to pursue as the skills that are going to give them that strength and independence to succeed in those industries? The first thing would be, rather than look for an opening somewhere or look for a skill set that you could be learning, start with what you most want to do. Because what you most want to do, that's the thing that's going to be most rewarding for you personally and the thing that you'll find easiest to invest time and passion in. Um, and the other thing is, I always, I always advise people to do the very best work they can all the time because I know too many professionals um, in, the, in the comic industry who will literally set a clock depending on the page rate they're getting from different publishers. You know, I can only afford 
I can only afford eight hours on this page, but I can afford two days in this one because it's a company that pays so more. Instead of becoming artists, they become accountants. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, like on the one hand, if you do your best work all the time, mm. you're going to get better faster. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, you know, like the the reward for people who are who are then engaging with the work that you've made is that much greater as well. So. I'm probably going to say the same thing, but just in my words, for instance, I would say, just almost identically, I would say, no, you can't get there from here, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. And if you pursue the thing that you love the most and you stay, you keep, you stay true to that, you keep an integrity towards that and not be swayed by all the kinds of influence of you should, you should do this, and, and you follow that line you will find your way through your own initiative to create the kind of, um, I don't know, resonance that it takes uh, to become good at what you're doing. Pretty much go along with what he's saying. Mm. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know of another way. Um, people are always trying to, to ask you, well, now what do I do next? What, what's the... You know, yeah. all I can say is what you say is do the best work you can. Um, always, always look for the things, the excuses you make for not doing the best work you're doing. Yes. And try to see the self lie. The self lie is, is well, I'll take care of that problem tomorrow. Yes. I mentioned that yesterday yeah. in the talk. If you can identify where you let yourself off the hook and take care of that, yeah. you're going to grow faster in your own development of your, with your own work. Uh, one final question for both of you. Uh, the original plan this morning was that uh, John Byrne was going to join us for a, a yeah. three-way conversation. And what all three media and all three artists have in common is that this is a character-centric way of presenting narrative. So in the way that John develops or conceives of characters for uh, the theatre or for television through the Slab Boys or Tutti Frutti, you've had this experience of having to take pre-existing um, internationally iconic figures and reimagine them. And in the franchises that exist in, in Hollywood with anything from Stuart Little to the characters in Harry Potter as they grow or the environment or what you're doing in Moana where you, you have an entirely different set of challenges of how uh, these figures are realized uh, in a film env environment what you guys are doing as well as telling images with um, uh, telling stories with images is imagining yourself as characters or trying to get inside the the groups of mm -hmm. people and characters in, in the narrative um, do you have any particular thoughts about how uh, in, in particular you make distinctions between heroes and villains or between winners and losers or where, where do you see that in the spectrum of characters that you're asked to represent we look at each other. <laughs> to start that one. It's a bit of a mess of a question. That's a huge question. Um, the main thing is that it's about it's about characters. So when you're well, I, I you see he works a lot with what what you were just describing, and sometimes I'll work with aesthetic story. Mm -hmm. In other words, it may not be a narrative kind of story. It may be look at the beauty of that line. Look at the beauty of the human form, and look at how those things move and connect. That's not a narrative story, but it is an aesthetic story, right? And to me, that's just as much of a story, it's just a different kind of story. You spoke about it as a musical thing yesterday in terms it, of proportion. If you get inside, if you get inside your character, or you get inside of the thing that you, mm -hmm. you need to embody your story. And I think in order to present it, when you present it from the inside out, in that sense, right? So you're using your own experience and climbing inside the and character. Yeah, and, and, and in some sense, you become a f performer, in that sense. I, I find myself here, I'm studying, and now I'm performing, right? So, and I see that as a good thing, not as a bad thing, it's just, but uh, one, one needs to find it, and, and if, it, if it comes through right, it's true. There's a truth about it. One gets to experience one art, one's art that way. And of course, there is that kind of like eternal idea of the correspondence between truth and beauty. Yes. That the aesthetic correspondence. Is right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I I agree with all that Carol said. Um, 
with what I do, sometimes I have characters like Batman and Joker, for instance. Uh, sometimes uh, I'm given iconic characters and asked to kind of reimagine them, and sometimes I'm asked to just deal with them the way I would deal with them. Uh, and in both cases, you actually have to kind of you have to kind of be that person, or you have to channel something of yourself. Um, but you mentioned integrity earlier on and and one of the things again going back to the advice uh, for for people that are, are wanting to find a way of doing it for themselves um, you have to you have to actually work with what you've got you've got to keep pushing it and trying to get better but the idea that what you bring as an individual any of us is something that nobody else can bring mm -hmm. so, and even in even in a team as big as a giant animation um, crew crew, you know there is there's there's something to be said for having for each of those people bringing something of themselves to to whatever bit of the work they're doing. I, I'm going to cheat and ask an, a final final question, which is about observation, because as you were saying that in the last conversation that I had with uh, John about the way that he gets dialogue uh, into the air when he's creating the scenarios or the characters for mm -hmm. stage or for television or for film uh, is one of the things that he's, he knows he has that a lot of people maybe don't is a fantastic year for dialogue and for speech patterns. And a very big part of what I find myself trying to encourage students to do is rather than falling in love with other people's images is to be clearly and fully aware of the world they inhabit the people that they sit next to on the bus, uh, the, the spaces that, that are actually outside the windows of their building, to what degree do you feel as artists that you are acutely or hyper-observational or is that is that a visual thing, an audio thing? Do you have... Because you, you, there's dialogue in... It's it, everything. Yeah. 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 I mean, you, you were talking yesterday about capturing, capturing gestures, capturing the story in a in a pose or in an yeah, expression, all that story. and you know you get that with the you get that with somebody somebody standing in a corner for a date that hasn't turned up has got a very different look to somebody who's turned up five minutes early <laughs> for the date and, and they're convinced yeah. the person's coming. Physically, it's the same it, character, but yeah, the but the way, yeah. yeah, and you know, if if you've got a passion for for doing this kind of thing, you notice that you notice that in the in the people around you. Yeah. I'm pretty much in agreement with that, and um, you know, you know, just awareness of the space that we're in. Mm. For instance, look at, the, at this configuration we're mm. in here, and everything else that's going on around us. I mean, in a certain sense, it's its own drama. Yeah. And if one becomes aware of that, then uh, one embodies it. And in a way, that's part of the performance of life. We're missing it because we're not paying attention to it. It's like missing a life. Sure. Right. There was that. We had this. I was trying to explain the difference between East and West Scotland. We sat yeah. and had our lunch at GCU yesterday, and the lady who came to take the plates away, she just looked straight at Carl and went, "Oh, you've got beautiful eyes." Like this. <laughs> and Carl was kind of, "What is this?" And I, when I sent an email to John, I was like, "I said to me, that's a very Glasgow moment." And John's yeah. like, "Oh yeah, that's <laughs> Glasgow. Like you know, that's not that's yeah, not going to happen." Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> Guys, I can't thank you enough, and I Thanks, uh, also really want to thank uh, Martin Craig, all the staff and the uh, support people at Kelvin Grove for oh, allowing right. us the space and the time to come in. And, and then also, I just want to yeah. tell you how brilliant I think you are. Oh, thank you very really much. Great, the feeling's mutual. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So, join us next time on whatever this continuing <laughs> series of Animation Centrifuge uh, interview and uh, conversation pieces is, and thanks also to the guys at Gumshoe for capturing it on film, and uh, yeah, be inspired. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.